All right, I think we're ready to go live here on another one. Cool, looks like we're good. Uh, all right, let's switch over. Um, so last time we were gonna build another utility, uh, what was it called, WebScribe? It was gonna index uh, YouTube videos, give me the transcript. Throw it in, do some kind of rag retrieval where, you know, I ask it some questions, it searches the transcripts, maybe inject some additional context. Uh, and then I realized that it's Thursday and, you know, I'd set myself a goal of writing at least one blog post a week here. And I had one that had been rolling around that I really wanted to, to explore. But before I went there, I wanted to see if there were any kind of lower friction, easy things to go write about uh, based on kind of what I'd written. So I decided, hey, let's go try write that. I wrote that. Uh, I'm glad I did because I ended up running out of uh, GPT um, credits till the next hour. Uh, so I can't repeat it on screen. Um, it was going to kind of be the idea, walk through it again. But I'll just go through the script, kind of talk through, show how I use WebCat. Um, I think it's good to at least document that. And then I wanted to touch on another tool um, that's helping me solve problems in another area uh, called free play. Uh, it's very GPT <laughs> related, uh, not necessarily custom GPTs, but it still fits into the, the GPT space, uh, open a I APIs and such. Uh, cool. So let's start off by kind of just talking through what I was doing. Um, so WebCat's gone through a couple adjustments, uh, most notably, I mean, Obviously, we sh if you've seen things, you know that uh, it's now running as an Azure function. Uh, the big thing I had to do was make a few adjustments to the robots. Um, so basically, if the file didn't exist, it would always return that access was denied, uh, which was a bit of a problem because, you know, it should. if the robot file's not there, then I don't have to respect it, right? I mean, that's kind of the idea. Uh, so I got that working, um, you know, just the general, hey, it worked, let's go use it in the real world type of scenarios. Um, so not, not a lot. I mean, it's still, still just 60 lines of code. Um, so I, th I think we're still doing good. It's a nice little tiny snippet. Uh, it seems to fit well within a function. Uh, the other issue is having is that sometimes robots will just deny you. Um, when we get to free play, they have documentation. I wanted to bring some of that in. The robots file says no. So I've given an optional ignore robots parameter um, basically so the gpt if prompted such will go fetch the information and ignore the robots file generally so far it's behaved such that it respects the robots file that's kind of the default behavior you have to know to prompt it to ignore the robots file um it tells you it was denied by the robots so i mean i don't think it's a hard step for people to get there uh maybe it is maybe it isn't i'm the only one using it so i'm gonna say it's not uh what else i think i think those are the adjustments making an optional parameter to respect the robots or not and just kind of making sure that if the robots file doesn't exist i always return true and that it's accessible so webcat's up you know it's getting battle tested it's working in scenarios i want to keep using it because i specifically as we walk through this you'll find kind of how it was adding value uh, and I think, you know, it'll be an interesting avenue to continue to explore how I can bring these little snippets of data um, in, you know, uh, in into the conversation, kind of help make it more useful. Uh, I could have went and copied and pasted. Sure. You know, that, that just takes longer. It's more annoying. Um, these are short, not super long. They're just meant to kind of be these sparks of ideas that I kind of wax on a little bit, something that maybe would have been just a really simple tweet. Speaking of which, I probably want to go uh, actually tweet about having this article, I'm trying to hit at least Twitter and LinkedIn with things. Probably need to get better at the whole social media management thing. That's a problem for a different day. Uh, anyway, so WebCat's here. I'm using it. Uh, so I just said, you know, I'm throwing a URL in. Uh, it's going to tell me da 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 da. So as much as I prompt the underlying GPT and I keep telling it to give me the full text regardless, it always seems to default to this kind of summary thing after a day. It's fine. I can tell the full text, please, and it's pretty good at bringing through the full text. So I got it to bring through uh, the first article. Uh, so the articles I wrote, I think the three I wrote um, already on AI Buddy. And, uh, okay, then let's say, uh, now I'm getting smart. I'm just saying full text of. And if I do that, WebCat knows, okay, he wants the full text. Let me go get that, admit it here. Um, 
And then I'm like, okay, cool. So you've got some some context about the things I've been writing on. Um, I, I feel kind of varied. They're just, like I said, they're just ideas that, you know, I want to I want to explore a little bit more than just putting a tweet out on. Um, so I'm like, so given the AI body articles, uh, are there new blog posts we can think about, or a few of them to consider? So is there is sorry, is there a blog post? And I was like, oh wait, maybe there's a few options. And this is like, hey, given the insights and themes, there's several things, kind of the evolution of the AI-human collaboration beyond assistance to partnership, uh, the renaissance of creativity in, in the age of AI. So this is the one that really sparked me going, okay, this this really aligns to a story that's been rolling around my head. Um, you know, it's something that, not necessarily with regards to writing, arts, music, and design, but more kind of home core to me, uh, software and how I feel ChatGPT is really democratizing access to that for folks with, you know, a creative streak, a desire to kind of maybe do a little bit of code. They're not, they may not become professionals. Who cares? I, I still write blogs. I'm not a professional author. Um, you know, I do woodworking as a hobby. I'm not a professional furniture maker. Um, but it, you know, it's an outlet. It's an opportunity for me to express and to create and to bring to life something that maybe was out of my reach before. That, that was kind of the, the essence of what I was trying to explore. Um, you know, beyond making me a professional faster and better at what I do, um, it, it really closes that gap. Um, you know, future role is shaping new communication paradigms. Yeah, I kind of went there. Maybe there's more to dig on. I don't I don't think that seed's quite grown enough. Uh, reinventation of learning, personalized education through conversational AI. Now, that, that could be interesting. I think there might be something there. I would need to go do a whole lot of research um, on that. I'd have to kind of break out of the chat and go get a little more up to speed. So, you know, that's something I might put in my hat for later. Uh, the Unix philosophy, imagine a, that kind of seems like they're rehashing, another rehash of what's there. Uh, bridging human intuition and AI logic, the future of problem solving. That kind of seems to be the space. I, mean, I'm, I guess I'm exploring more of the creative side, but I would say there's still some problem solving aspects when I'm writing like the, the Webcat GPT um, Azure function or when I wrote the code. and trying to troubleshoot and debug and you know there's probably there's probably an avenue to, to to explore there too i think you know i could probably dig a little bit more into how i use it to do that how it's different to copilot i'm not trying to knock on the product copilot it just doesn't fit my style um it, i really have found kind of the small auto suggests that happen in vs code um, whether it's knowing I want to just replace this or I want to insert a variable for printing. Those those little things are just so monumentally helpful. I don't need big blocks. I just need those little little tiny time savers. Uh, ethics and the human touch, navigating the future with care. Ethics. Yeah, ethics, I think, is kind of always going to be there, um, especially if you're Google. Um, I don't know how they train their stuff or if they're just kind of well i mean generally i think the sense is they they moved too fast uh trying to play catch up um anyway that's a different topic for a different day so it's given me some ideas some of them good some of them not so good what you would expect i mean it's a computer think of it just like another talking to a person now not just talking to a machine that will always repeatedly do the same thing but you know, a person trying to be helpful, trying to, you know, respond to the instruction you've given it. Uh, so I'm like, you know, I really like two and seven. I think there's something interesting there. And they're like, great, great choices. It's always super positive, always super verbose. Like, those are some things that will probably need to be adjusted to get slightly more human type qualities. But it's a machine that we're trying to find utility in. And uh, maybe more human like qualities isn't the way. Um, Maybe it is. We'll find out. Time will tell. So it's giving me a brief outline, like how to do it. You know, it's super useful, at, like getting going, breaking that kind of friction of movement, getting an idea moving, and uh, then it's telling me this. I mean, like if I really wanted to, I could go. I could probably go research these things. I mean, it wouldn't be hard to now take this, kind of go through maybe a more traditional blog writing approach, where maybe next week I do pick one of these up and I kind of continue to use the tooling here um, to do that. Maybe, you know, hopefully we can finish the web scribe, get the transcripts coming in. I'd really like to write an article on, on WebCat and just my experience of creating a GPT to kind of help augment my creative process by writing tools. Something's got to be there. Um, you know, so it's, it's laid things out. It made it sensible. Obviously, you're going to have to go source things, but it's giving you an idea of kind of how to present this idea, how to structure it. The, the things you should be looking for is with anything 
it's not going to be 100 percent but it's going to help you get pointed in the right direction it's going to help you kind of understand the landscape that little bit that you need maybe you already knew it maybe that's all you know old information to you uh, was was i find it useful uh, so let's write a blog about creativity, and then I was like, okay, cool. I want to zone in on how ChatGPT is unlocking a world of hobbyist software to folks with little to no experience, allowing them to create things previously beyond their reach. Now, there's a story behind this, and we'll start to discuss that now. I want to explore a story of a guy uh, from a local meetup, uh, Boulder AI Builders, uh, where he got up and explained how he's writing code for one year, and he went from making nothing not knowing what a compiler was to writing an app in apple vision pro app um his sixth of that year uh, I, I think that was remarkable you know someone with zero experience is able to kind of uh, his, his words he took the um the basic exercises from the open ai page and started just feeding those in and kind of moved out from there on how to build things kind of just took some examples fed it into the machine asked for guidance uh, and, you know, he started to find a, a new passion, a new skill. Um, it, at the very least, it, it's allowed him an opportunity to be creative and express things that he just wouldn't have been able to do before. And I think that's, for me, that's a central message of, of what AI is here to help us do. It's here to help unlock human potential. And I know he's not alone. I know there are other folks out there. Um, I just spoke to one of my colleagues, Jeff, about a similar experience. You know, he's a design director, he's got a small background in software, uh, but he's using ChatGPT to kind of help explore a concept. He's building a game. Like, that's awesome. You know, you're really helping bridge that gap for folks to kind of fill that creative need um, in a different way. And I, I'm all for it. Um, uh, so six that background song you know try to give a little bit of detail i probably didn't do super awesome it's a couple weeks ago so it's based on what i remember um so then it gave me a first draft unleashing the create unleashing creativity how chat gpt is democratizing software uh, development and i i like that title i think that's really kind of central to what i'm looking for sounds good gives me a good article outline some points uh, as we shift to profound, and we expect a surging innovation and diversity in software. You know, it's an okay first draft. I'm like, hey, the dude's name is um, Jonas. Jondis? I, it's not Jondis. Uh Sorry, I, I, I'm struggling to pronounce that name, and I've given it a link to the, to the app. Uh, so it's going to give me a little more information here. It's like, oh, you can click here to go find the app. Um, I was like, okay, mention him, but don't only focus on him. This is a great example. A few have heard focusing on folks using ChatGPT to help accelerate the learning and creative process. So just wet, red weird seeing his name all over. Um, then I was like, okay, you know, it gave me a couple different variants of things. So there's a couple um, intro pieces here that I thought had slightly, you know, went together as one solid um, piece. Uh, so the heart of Boulder, vibrant community, and researching the software as well as undergoing remarkable transformation. So it's giving me something that's kind of combined, uh, yeah, combined in a little bit more fluid manner. And I don't remember what I was playing. I select, selected the whole thing. Uh, oh, so I said mix into version two, parts of version one, because uh, there were bits and pieces. So then it, it tried to do that. Um, doesn't always get it right. So you, you really do have to use your eyes as a human being to kind of verify the work, make sure things are sensible. Uh, so then it's like, okay, you know, put this together. I did a little editing in Ghost. You know, if you really want to see that, I can probably go to Ghost and do it, but I don't think it's a critical piece of the puzzle. Uh, I'm just like, you know... <sighs> kind of just refer to him i'm introducing one guy uh is a fine article so it's just doing some edits is it grammatically correct to use him he or his instead of his name uh i asked because he left his name in i'm not very good at grammar and spelling so these advances in tech that help fix that are very very awesome in my opinion uh and like can you just the text okay accordingly please so i'm asking them to do the thing i asked before well they the chat gpt 
And I was like, can you go import the full text of this Apple app thing? And now here's where it gets interesting. It's like, obviously the GPT is like, hey, I know this content. Like, I can't, I can't do that. Um, gave me a summary. I asked for the full text. Still didn't do it. So, you know, as much as I try, I, I think there's, there are going to be limitations to the webcat capability. Um, just some internal guardrails to chat GPT that I seem unable at this point to override. I didn't poke super hard. Um, maybe let's copy that. We can go try jamming on WebCat a little tiny bit. Uh, okay, so then I copied and pasted it in because, you know, it's the old school way. Uh, please adjust the article given the app description. So I want to just kind of make sure I get the facts right. I'm not just I'm not misremembering or misrepresenting what this app can do. Um, you know, it's it's cool because it puts a few different pieces. It's AI written that's leveraging AI to kind of add value um, to the user's life. So it, just this really neat culmination of of technologies. So I'm gonna paste the article back in. Uh, uh, which section does it fit under? So I've asked for some adjustments uh, about his app, and then I'm like, okay, you gave me a section of text where you want it. It may have explained it to me. It may just be that I didn't see it. Um, so then I'm like, okay, cool. I have this. This is the whole article, comprehensive overview. Uh, any expandy section about one or two paragraphs. It's not very good at understanding this. It, it doesn't really know when I say, hey, add one to two paragraphs to each section, what that means. It just kind of reiterates the same thing, maybe changes a sentence or two. I mean, it knows that once I, I want adjustments, it's just not sure the extent or the nature of those adjustments. So quantitative things, it doesn't seem to be super good at, which I guess if it's not good at math, makes sense. Um, you know, maybe when we get some of that self-learning from Go Alpha uh, coming through, it might be a bit better. I, I don't know, I'm being hopeful. Uh, can you give me a fuller article that expands sections for everything listed except a particular section that it already kind of jammed on? It's trying, you know, I compared it to the original. And then I was like, you know, actually, just, just the last two sections I think could, could use a little bit more information there. So I wanted to see what it could do. And I'm like, yeah, okay, these these seem better. There's just that extra little bit of depth that I'm looking for. So then I was like, okay, here's the full article. Always like to kind of close the loop. It's like, oh, your comprehensive article captures the essence of how AI, particular ChatGPT, is revolutioning software development. So it's super positive. Oh, excuse me. A story not only showcases individual achievement, but also reflects the global movement towards more accessible and diverse technology innovation, emphasizing the endless possibilities that AI collaboration presents for the future. Absolutely. I mean, that's really the theme I'm trying to drive on is how this unlocks innovation, how this starts empowering people who maybe didn't have access to tooling like software. You don't need to be the best developer in the world to make something that's going to inspire someone else or make something that solves a problem you have or make something that adds value to someone else's life. Like, you know, craft is cool. Craft was king. Craft will always be important. But, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a hobbyist woodworker. I'm, I'm not going to maybe have the same level of requirement for some of the pieces I produce, like if I'm making a shelf for myself versus a client. Like the, the naturally a difference in expectation when it's a client relationship versus a personal project. Not to say I don't have high standards and I don't chief drive for certain things, you know, to be really good in my own work artifacts. But... You know, maybe I'm just slightly more forgiving in, in just getting the concept expressed versus making it polished and perfectly presentable. Um, there's a phrase like, don't let enemy be the good of perfect. And I think a lot of the times, if we focus too much on craft and software, that gets in the way. We have all these principles we trip on when they're just meant to be guiding. They just help there to make things easier. And my experience, if you just try to make the simplest software possible that reads like a story, you're going to have all these principles generally encapsulated. You know, it's going to be small. It's going to be modular. It's single level of abstraction. It's for the most part going to solve, follow the solid um, rules. Although you may or may not choose to use uh, inversion of control type mechanisms, dependency injection. That's, you know, nature and state of your system. Uh, anyway, that's me going on about just write things that are small, pretty, and simple. <laughs> I, even in complex software, you know, I've spent a good chunk of my career writing really large distributed systems. And 
it doesn't make it any harder. In fact, I think it makes it easier because you're forced to kind of think modularly. You can't just shove everything into one giant executable and run it on a machine. <laughs> Um, you know, usually where that becomes a problem is the typical three-layered architecture, and oh, I'm just gonna make bigger databases, and you know, everything's a stored procedure, and I just got a UI on top of it. And I've seen systems do that, and they work. And you know, here I'm just telling about stories about things working, and not ragging on it too much, but I've spent too much of my life you know, poking at those things and <laughs> trying to help people put tests on old T-SQL uh, stuff. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a bugbear for me. Uh, anyway, so we get to the end, the article's there, the piece is presented, I was like, okay, it's just a thought piece, like, you know, don't go too deep on, like, all these other things I could add, like, sure, you know, I could probably go interview the guy and, like, put a whole bunch of more information in, but, like, these are just thoughts, these are just things I want to explore right now, I'm not, I'm not trying to get super, super deep, you know, I, I don't want the blog to be this, like, 15-minute piece, it's just there to kind of inspire, um, I'm definitely going to plan on connecting with this gentleman. You know, I think he's got an interesting story uh, regardless. Uh, so then it's, it gave me this image, and I actually really liked it as a first time through. Um, <laughs> I was like, actually, you know, we got a lot of them with, the, like, the human skull and whatnot. Maybe it's a theme. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I'm just kind of going with JetGPT. You know, the idea is for me to use this as a creative tool to express doing something that I don't normally do, creative writing or just writing uh, in general, you know, outside of kind of work needs. Um, so I got this, and then I'm like, okay, uh, expand on this section a bit. I, I want to come back and maybe just make a, a slight adjustment. And I'm like, unlike Copilot, uh, we'll comment the code so it's easy to follow along and guides and advises along the way, not just producing the next segment, uh, more like more integrated tooling. It's about the dialogue, not finding the, the next step in the solution. That's what it should have been. Thankfully, chat GPT is forgiving, so it gives me a little bit more depth there that kind of captures the essence of what I'm looking for. Um, and chat GPT is not going to know that. I mean, that's the whole point of doing this collaboratively is to get the big pieces there and then to come, you know, finesse that detail that gives it the polish. Uh, okay, add it into so then one more final article. Um, you know, I suppose I should have exited WebCat. I didn't have to talk specifically to WebCat this whole time. <laughs> But, you know, it happens. Uh, then I'm like, cool, can you write me a short LinkedIn post? So it's giving me this. Uh, can you, I was like, mm, I'll just make a generic. I don't really want to call this guy out specifically. You know, I'm using his story to tell a story um, based on kind of what I learned. I don't feel bad because when we were there, it was announced there were press. There were people there taking photos and writing articles outside of just me sitting there to be an observer. Um, you know, there must have been 12 VCs in the room as well, <laughs> in this tiny little room in Boulder. Um, but that seems to be the scene here. Um, you know, 100 people shoved into a small room, everyone clamoring to see what people are working on, how we can make use of this. Uh, at the very least, it's engaging. It's building a community. It's all the things I'm I'm for. Uh, then I'm like, okay, cool, nice, sounds good. Give me some hashtags. So I took some hashtags because, you know, why not? Uh, oh, and then I'm like asking about some post publishing adjustments. I was like, there's this really cool quote that I want to kind of put into a block coat. And I'm, you know, trying to figure out the design side here too, how to make it slightly more uh, visually appealing than just text on a page. Uh, so central to his rapid development journey was ChatGPT, which has proven indispensable for hobbyist developers, simplifying the complexities of code into conversational guidance. ChatGPT has served as both a tutor and a collaborator, enabling him and others to navigate the intricate world of software development with ease. And like, is a black block coat between the last two sections good? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe there's another bot in here, kind of like a design bot that <laughs> can go take a picture of the whole thing and tell me, you know, here's some basic guidance. Not deep guidance, just like a top five, like, yeah, you know, these you look good, or you don't need to consider these, or have you considered this? That that kind of stuff. Not deep, just just something to sharpen it up a little bit. Uh, so it says placing a block cut. So I try to take a picture. Um, so I'm probably just gonna keep pulling bots out for the things I find myself doing to make my life easier. And it's like, yes, it can be effective. I was like, okay, cool. So I ended up putting it, um, I think, between these two sections here, so it didn't feel odd. 
kind of felt like a natural transition. That's the piece that's probably not going to be very good at telling me um, to do. Uh, and then I was like, can you make a 300 character or less excerpt too? Just, you know, love my typing. Uh, and it gives me something that makes sense. I'm going to leave the hashtags off for the article. Uh, and here's the article, you know, Democratizing Development, How ChatGPT Empowers Creative Minds. Uh, I got some links out, just trying to give credit to people and things, you know, if someone stumbles across, uh, you can get to the Boulder uh, meetup, you can go to this dude's LinkedIn, uh, you can get to his app, and um, that all seems fair. And then it just kind of, you know, goes through the story that we built together, another call to his app in the App Store. Um, you know, here's that block quote around kind of really central theme, I think, to this whole story. Uh, and there it is, you know, just something nice, easy to chew on, think about. Um, not not exploring things in great depth. When I do the webcat one, I'll probably go a bit deeper because there's a lot of detail in there. Uh, but I'll need the web scribe to go pull the transcripts to then kind of like wax and wane on that concept. Just a second. All right, so that's kind of how I made a made use of the tool we made to enhance my creative process in writing blogs. Didn't take me long; must have taken me about an hour to put that together. Um, you know, where in the past I find there's a lot of friction in just trying to get going, get started. You know, beyond just sketching out the idea, I'm bringing some meat to that skeleton, um, and that's what ChatGPT is really good at. I find kind of giving it a idea or helping explore where ideas could be, going after one and kind of producing something. Now, don't take it the first, second, or third draft. Just like if I was writing in person, those aren't going to be the best ones. Um, you know, there may be better ones later on and more revisions, but at some point, I got to draw a line because it's telling the story I want and the way I want, highlighting the details I want. And I feel this did a good job of that. So that's why we took a break from exploring WebScribe. I just wanted to show how I'm using the tooling. I produced another article. Um, it's finding it super useful. It is really helping me become better, faster, stronger with just that one new tool. I can't wait to see what WebScribe does and how it changes the landscape. Um, you know, I'm not a big podcast, list, podcast listener, but maybe there's a space out there too to start indexing and bringing through uh, podcast to... Uh, Recordings, I, I probably need to start exploring that landscape too. Uh, all avenues, I'm more of a traditional reader, um, but you know, that takes time as well. Uh, and there's only so many hours in a day. Anyway, so that's that. I'm going to switch focuses here over to something called free play. Uh, why am I talking about free play? Well, it's a really cool little utility um, that helps with the a really key aspect of working with LLMs, specifically if you're writing software on your more traditional design product, engineering, DevOps um, type of flow. Uh, it's neat. It's it's from Boulder, um, uh, Ian, the CEO of the company, uh, runs the, the meetup uh, that I was just describing. Uh, so I think there's kind of a natural synergy here between the two. Uh, if you get a chance, go look at it, request access. Um, I think it's pretty cool. There's some pretty good information under the blogs, really good thought leadership here. Uh, the documentation I found is really awesome. This is where I was having an issue trying to bring this in with Webcat because they don't allow any robots. Fair enough. Honestly, though, I found that I didn't need to necessarily come here after using the tool um, well. That was the, the fun and interesting thing. So I'm going to just drag over this other tab here. Um, so I've logged in. I've got an account. Let's go back to the beginning. So you got to make a project. And in the project, you have prompts. And we'll walk through a few things. So I've got this really simple spell check, you know, the typical test, whatnot. It's got some really nice graphs here. So it's going to tell me kind of the cost of running this prompt. My P99, my P90, my average. The latency, latency is going to be a big factor. Excuse me. As we move into the LLM world, you know, how long are people willing to wait for the value it adds? Um, you know, we're seeing seconds here. <laughs> not not milliseconds, full-on seconds uh, in how it comes about. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we're seeing kind of the success, the eval success. I built a little bit of test around it um, to see how it works. Um, so here we go. Uh, we're going to go into the prompt. 
Um, so there's a lot of tight integration between this and being able to run code. So like the idea would be that I come here as a product person. I work with prompts and model versions to kind of figure out what I want. I dial that in. Uh, and then the engineer is able to pick that up. You know, you can go to the copy code. It's super awesome. It generates everything, you know, that's the template name, project ID, just enough to kind of get you going and get it working. Um, you, you might need the rest of the documentation that I was showing earlier uh, if you want to be able to kind of call back and, um, well, if you want to call into OpenA OpenAI API. I don't think this actually uh, makes use of that. Uh, unless I'm missing it. Uh, anyway, so you can do it Python. You can give it to your node in, in Java, which is pretty nice. I, I really like that. Uh, so you can see I've got different versions here. Um, so let's uh, let's go edit this. Um, and the idea is... Uh, I give it a little segment. Um, it's meant to go through, validate grammar, spelling, grammar, and cadence. It basically just does spelling. Uh, I made any corrections as a JSON blob without the markdown uh, code block formatting. This was important because before I was getting ticks, and I'll go back to a previous version to show you that. In fact, uh, we'll do it in a sec. Uh, indicating the word that was updated, its location in the input is zero base index. The blob needs to also have a field called corrected that contains the fully corrected text. So it's calling out, hey, the second word, um, second word, second index? I, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to say second index, but that's not 100% right. Zero, one, two. Oh, no, it is. Zero base got me again. Uh, and then peanuts. And then butters scene. So it's it's giving me the corrected phrase. It's telling me what got corrected where. Um, you know, pretty cool. I got a version. I got a message. It's doing some stuff. So the the thing that I find super awesome is this ability to kind of go compare the two side by side and start adding test cases. Uh, so if we go back to this one here, so this is running on Claude. This is running on uh, GPT. I can go click the button here and it will now run the two next to each other. So you can see here, Claude's, Claude's still giving me a bunch of garbage. Like if I'm using this in a, in a situation where I just want the JSON, this is gonna be annoying to me. Like very annoying to me. <laughs> like I, I appreciate that, but you know, I didn't ask for any of that. Um, GPT's a bit more tuned in. Now there's probably something I need to do here to make this different, to make this work better. Um, Let me just go find a, a few things. Um, so I, I was I was playing around, and uh, you know I put a little bit of Sir mix a lots um, song lyrics in here just because I thought it was funny, um, a way to test it. <laughs> it was literally the first thing that came to mind. I'm not trying to be offensive, um, and I, I thought this was super interesting with a. Eh. So it says a eh should be an and okay fair enough uh you know it is it is the next word <laughs> as we can see here so claude's like well you should just finish the phrase a little bit more with an itty bitty <laughs> which which may or may not have been the text it's just it's just interesting that it kind of inferred that from from the rest of it here um what i think is also super interesting uh did that one is if i put in a slightly different misspelling and I did it yesterday, so let's hope that it does the same thing today. Um, I get different corrections. Oh, okay, so it's doing this one. So yesterday it wasn't coming back with this version always having um, an itty-bitty. If I go add a test case and we put back in the original. And I run that. Okay, some something seems to have gone a little wonks. I'm probably doing something wrong. Anyway, I'll run them individually. They seem to be working a little bit better. Oh, that one's having some issues. Claude's probably having some problems here. Um, so what uh, and itty bitty. So just just interesting to kind of see how the different versions interact. Um, if I go back to um, well, let's go back to the version I say I have in prod. Uh, 
Okay, so I've taken out, uh, I made any correction as a JSON blob. So I'm, a I'm asking for it to, uh, oh, here we go. So this is pre me removing the JSON formatting for Markdown. So it's giving me a slightly different output. So this is a ah, and this is a. Ah. It's slightly different model versions, as you can see here. Uh, if we go up to fixing a typo and we run this one, you know, it's pretty good at doing this. Um, you know, I really like the fact that I'm able to get in. I'm able to kind of test a few different prompts. I'm able to put variables in here. Um, you could, it's full mustache syntax. So if you wanted to put conditionals in and have it do something different, you're able to do that in your prompt engineering. And I, I think that's very accessible to most folks. So you can see here, I'm still getting the markdown uh, JSON stuff. Uh, here we go. I asked for it to not specifically admit that. And that's where it's picking that up to be a bit more intelligent. Uh, and then um, I ran the prompt through this. Um, so if I go back a version, uh, copy, we'll go forward. Um, you know, when I save, unfortunately, uh, let's make a change. It doesn't tell me what version was there, a name. It would be really cool if they used the AI to kind of automatically suggest a version in the description. Um, and that way I don't have to think about it. I can just possibly just give it a quick once over. We'll add another test case in. I really like this feature. And I, I'm going to run the prompt through the checker. Uh, and it's going to tell me I have some misspellings. A, uh, so and to A, different location, <laughs> interesting. The to this, the to the blob needs to. Okay, interesting. You know, diff slightly different model versions here. Same GPT, I'm getting slightly different output. Um, you know, pretty fascinating. And I thought it was a good use. It helped, it helped correct some things. Uh, and funny thing is, is like doing that did did slightly change um, some of the behaviors. Uh, it got a little more accurate. Um, not enough that I think I would really have noticed. Let's see, six, seven, everything's just slightly different. That's fascinating. It's indexing, I think, a little more accurate on this side. Yeah, zero. Well, that's zero, zero, butts. I don't know. Anyway, the whole point is it's really cool for doing that. You can click save. Um, I'm gonna just exit out of here. Um, you know, I've got tests, so when I run code, it's gonna be able to uh, run those tests. I've got a few test cases I've brought in from um, brought in from running code. So I took a little code sample, I executed it because it's the only way to get the graphs. Took me a little while to figure that out. Uh, and here this run's gonna tell me the cost, the latency, the total tokens used, the version, the provider, the temperature, API key needed to set that up, which environment, the inputs, the outputs. It's it's really comprehensive. I think it's a great way to start getting insight into things as they flow through your system, what works, what doesn't work. Um, I can click next, I think I can go to the next one, never done that. Um, it's pretty cool. So it all, it all pops up under the sessions here. So the idea was just taking one of these and going save as a test case. If I click that, it'll ask me which list, um, my really awesome name <laughs> list, uh, and away we go. Comparisons I haven't gotten to test. We're about running tests from your code against the test suite that you've built here, uh, which is interesting because you know we're kind of splitting that responsibility now. Like I'd say product's going to probably manage the prompts and maybe some of the test suite stuff. Engineers are going to care more about code and making sure that the CI pipeline passes according to those test runs. Um, settings, uh, API access. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I just set the API access for free play. Uh, you're going to need to go create your own open AI um, API keys if you're going to go that route. Um, come back here and is there anything else I wanted to show around. Uh, just you know, just the ability to get this this kind of level of tooling, this ability to play and compare with prompts and kind of navigate to code quickly. Um, I found it really useful. Uh, in fact, 
let me just throw some code here. There's a few different things going on, so you have to bear with me. Um, so here's here's the idea. Um, you know, I've got a .env file. It's got this stuff in it. I'm just telling it. Here's my prompt: I eat peanut butter for breakfast every day. Uh, and then it's going to go through retrieve a formatted prompt. Uh, so it's going to take this and inject the variables. Very nice. I like that. Uh, and then I'm going to go get an a open API client. I'm going to go, hey, you know, here's the message. What do you? What's your response? Start and end times. I'm going to add that. I'm going to log the call to free place so that I get the things on the dashboard. Uh, and then it's going to print out the response for me. So just a really simple little script to kind of just test things end to end, see what it looks like, get stuff to appear. Um, you know, most of this came from either the docs, well, reading the docs, working with the code samples. Um, I had gone through an exercise where I asked ChatGPT um, to uh, be better at helping me do that. And I think this is it. Uh, so, okay, yeah, here's where I try to get it to to bring in the SDK information. Needed to make changes. And here's me walking through uh, LM Crest and log of the call, like walking through trying to use that inputted information to, to do this. And then I realized that after trying to like use WebCat in this way, that it was just easier to kind of rely back on the old techniques of taking their code sample, looking at their documentation, which is very up to date, very accurate and getting that sample script to run so that I can start to see things here. So I think it's a great way if you're starting out, kind of trying to play with models. Uh, they're, they're looking to integrate with base 10, so you can start to run other types of more uh, open source models. You're not just locked into the two big providers there. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and then great, it just kind of helps me walk through, helps create a nice division between product. I like the environments. I like the accessibility of all this being easy to, to work with. Not in the you know accessibility is in like I need help navigating the internet way, uh, just that it's there. It's 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 fluid. It, it's it's very developer focused. I think it's got a good division with product, um, and like I I think it's going to add a lot of value. So I'm making it kind of a core part of my tool chain uh, as I start to do more um, code focused things. Really looking forward to that base ten integration so I can start to play with other pieces of my workflow. Uh, all right, cool. Well, I think that's everything. Um, I'll probably do another one maybe tomorrow, maybe Monday, uh, where I finish up uh, the, um, oh gosh, the WebScribe stuff. I might even do it over the weekend. We'll see how things go. Anyway, I hope you found that useful. Have a great day. Thank you.